Hello, everyone. I uh, just want to let you know I do a whole series of things on mostly the White House, various different things. And this one is called Presidential Peril because these are a lot of things where presidents either uh, got ill in office. Oh, do we have to put up the mic? Oh, no, to deal with the issue and it, they should have, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Well, as you see, some of our presidents had the, some of the greatest risks you've never heard about in our history. And this is one of our biggest issues. I mean, nobody had a government like we were setting up. Everything was a monarchy. Uh, I mean, we had so many things we had to decide, like we had to have a chief executive, we had to have a Supreme Court, we had to have uh, a way to collect revenue, and uh, we even had to have a capital, because that was, that was, that was very controversial. Uh, the capital, original capital was New York, my hometown, and then it was Philadelphia, and uh, Jefferson and Hamilton got together and arranged for a capital that the Southern legislators would approve. And that's why Washington's where it is. It was right in the middle of the 13 states. So with so many things that had to be done, uh, a lot of things were missed. <laughs> and uh, this is a plan of the original uh, District of Columbia and that was an issue too, because the land originally belonged to Maryland and Virginia. So they had to have an independent district so they would be not subject to the state law of either state. I mean, it was a whole different bag. Well, here's some of the things we forgot. <laughs> One of them, what happens if a president is too ill to serve or dies in office? Uh, and how do we protect our chief executive? Uh, we had absolutely no plan, and you'll see. <laughs> and as you can figure out, this issue came up almost immediately. Our very first president, George Washington, in 1793, he had tumor surgery and was literally laid up on his side in bed for six weeks, which, you know, wasn't really gave him much chance to actually govern. Uh, and then the next year he fell ill with the flu and it was so severe that he wrote that uh, if he had had, he recovered, but if he got it again, it would probably have killed him. Uh, but unfortunately, George was a notorious hypochondriac, so we're not sure how accurate that was. I mean, really, his letters are full of all these gloomy prognostications about his death would be near, and he lived till 67, which was extremely good age for that time. Now, here's another later peril. Um, this is uh, President James Madison. He's our only chief executive actually to be on the field of battle. And the British were marching and engaged our force in Bladensburg. And we actually outnumbered them two to one, but we were all raw militia. And uh, the British were trained. They had the uniforms, they had the bayonets, and they had a terror weapon, shock and awe. It was called a Congreve rocket. And while the damage done was pretty negligible, it was a fearsome sight to see when they fired it at us. And we just broke and ran. And the president was forced to ride the 15 miles from Bladensburg, hoping to meet up with his wife, Dolly, who stayed as long as she could. She even wrote later that she said, said you know, two men from New York have come to scold me for staying. <laughs> so, but she she had left just before him, and they had prearranged places in the Virginia countryside where they would meet. But even then, it was twenty four hours before they found each other. And of course, either one of them could have been captured. And this is our first assassination attempt. This is President Andrew Jackson. Uh, ironically, he was coming from the Capitol from a funeral 
ceremony, and this deranged man fired two pistols at him. And uh, what happened was the president, uh, who had a famous temper, actually uh, subdued him himself because neither one of the guns fired. And uh, he just literally caned him on the steps of the Capitol until they could hustle him away. And he was put in an insane asylum. And uh, but here's the real kicker. A uh, hundred years later, because the government took title to those, you know, pistols and they uh, loaded them and they both fired on the first try. It was something like a one in 125,000 chance <laughs> that they didn't fire when this guy named Lawrence wanted them to fire. So, you know, that was, that was, that was it. And it was really funny because uh, at that time, it was widely believed in the United States that assassinations were something foreigners did you know, unstable thing, places like France. And uh, so it was not believed to be in the American character. Okay, here's our next president, President William Henry Harrison. He died 32 days after taking the oath of office. He actually gave the longest inaugural speech in our entire history. And he failed to wear a coat. He was just wearing a frock coat. And he was far more ill than that, but this hastened his symptoms. And he was, for his time, quite old. And, uh, and this is where we really had a problem because we had no plan for a president dying in office. There was no ceremony. There was no way, there was no way to figure out who was in charge until the vice president could take the oath of office. And uh, luckily in those days, Washington was fairly small place and it was pretty easy to get people together for that. But uh, one of the customs that was invented at that time was holding the president's funeral in the East Room of the White House. And we've followed that ever since. And this was even rather spectacular. President John Tyler was a widower who was seeing uh, Julia Gardner, uh, whose family were wealthy New Yorkers, and they have a whole island named for them off the coast of Long Island. And uh, they both almost lost their lives. They were looking at a demonstration of a gun called the Peacemaker on the Potomac, and they fired two salutes and they decide to fire it again. And the president was below and he was on the way up to be on deck. Julia was already there with her father. And uh, what saved his life was that somebody was singing a patriotic song that he didn't, he, it had been a particular favorite. Is, so he paused to hear it. And then all hell broke loose up above. And uh, Julia's father was killed. The Secretary of War was killed. Quite a few others were killed. And in the rescue, the president picked Julia up and carried her across uh, on a plank. But she was unconscious. Whether she fainted or was stunned, uh, we don't know. But she revived right in the middle of them on the plank over the river. And she started to struggle because she didn't know what was happening. And so she almost pitched them both into the water and few people then knew how to swim. So that would have been serious, but they made it, they got married. Actually, he was the first president ever to marry in the White House, but not in the White House. They were married in New York, uh, but uh, that's, that's how it, it worked out for them. Now, not too much later, Zachary Taylor uh, was at a ceremony for the 4th of July, and it was an a, a absolutely brutally hot day. Anyone who's been in Washington in the summer will know what I'm talking about. And uh, he consumed a bowl of cherries and iced milk, and he developed gastrointestinal systems later. And... Uh, what happened was is that 
he died so suddenly that conspiracy theorists at the time, even though the word wasn't in use yet, thought that he had been poisoned. And it took over 100 years for this to be resolved. It wasn't resolved until the 1990s when his remains were exhumed and examined by Kentucky medical examiner to make sure that, that's, that he wasn't poisoned. And actually, he sort of was poisoned uh, because uh, he was literally killed by his doctors. And they fed him uh, calomel, ipecac, uh, and uh, morphine at 40 grains of whack, according to Samuel Elif Elliot Morrison, uh, our uh, historian, a famous American historian. And uh, I mean, it was literally suicide by doctor. And uh, Franklin Pierce as president elect was in a, a train accident they, he was actually on his way to Washington with his wife and his young son, and uh, the wheel sheared off and the whole car tumbled down an embankment. And uh, poor, he lost his son, Benny. Benny was decapitated. It was the, and he actually remains the only presidential person ever to be in a train wreck. And if he hadn't survived, I mean, that would have caused a, an unseeable constitutional crisis because uh, what do you do? The president-elect was dead. Do we keep the, uh, the president before him? Do we keep him as president? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, his running, Franklin Pierce's running mate, could he be the president? I mean, uh, I mean, it was just a miracle that he survived and we didn't have to face that, but we were kicking the can down the road. Now, Abraham Lincoln was also in mortal peril as president elect because uh, after the election round about Christmas, January, the Southern states began to put bills in their legislatures to secede from the union. They said they would if he got elected. And uh, uh, by the time he took the oath of office, which was still March 4th, uh, something like seven states had already left the union. And uh, he actually hired Alan Pinkerton to uh, be security. And yes, it's that Pinkerton, Pinkerton security. And... Uh, I mean, Pinkerton was so careful that he had the president elect had a dangerous place in, in Baltimore because Baltimore was a hotbed of secessionism. And he had to take a carriage from one station coming from Philadelphia uh, and go across town to another station to continue on to Washington, D.C. And uh, in order to make sure the president was more secure, Pinkerton actually had the wires, the telegraph wires cut from Philadelphia going south. Now, these were all owned by the Western Union Company. He had absolutely no authority to do this, but he did. And that possibly saved the president elect's life. And uh, so uh, Lincoln came into town in, in secret. Nobody knew when he was going through Baltimore, probably in a closed carriage. And, uh, but it still wasn't over because in the customary trip down Pennsylvania Avenue, which they still do, you, you, you just saw it, you know, in uh, 2021, uh, the Pinkerton had it really ultra, ultra security. He had men with badges in the crowd to listen to chatter to see if anyone had guns, if anyone's talking about killing them, because Washington itself was very Southern in its ways. And so there was a real likelihood that something could have happened. And uh, he stationed sh uh, sharpshooters on the roof, he and General Winfield Scott. And uh, another thing is, the escorts, and you see in the picture, they look like they're wearing civilian clothes, but they were actually cavalry people. And they deliberately 
pull the reins on their mounts so that the horses would bob and weave. So if anyone tried to put a gun outside of a window, they would more than likely hit him, uh, the horse or the rider, rather than Lincoln. And that wasn't over yet because later in 1864, someone, when he was going to the Summer White House, which you can still see, it's, uh, it's on the Naval Observatory grounds, I believe. And uh, he was riding back and somebody took a shot at him and knocked his hat clean off of his head and his horse bolted. So that's how close his shot was. And, uh, but as we all know, somebody got to him. And that was a story in itself because uh, uh, Booth, being an actor, uh, had seen in the papers that uh, the president was supposed to appear at Grover's Theater to see another show. At the last minute, the White House said he was going to Ford's Theater to this show. And so he carefully prepared it. One of the things he did is that he found the door unlocked. The lock was actually broken and it wasn't repaired in the box. And uh, he actually uh, had a stick about this long and he gouged it uh, in the plaster wall and he carried the stick with him because what he was going to do is that this, is, this was his plan. He was going to go to the outside of the box. He was going to knife a, 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 the guard who was supposed to be there. Uh, Mr. Uh, John Parker was not there as he was supposed to be. And so Booth knew the door would open and he carefully put the, stuck the stick between the door and the wall so that nobody could get in. And he shot the president. That's why he leapt from the box <laughs> onto the stage. And uh, it was really uh, uh, terrible because, uh, and the weird thing was, is that this is the funeral in the East Room and uh, that's the catafalque and, and they use it in lying in state in the Capitol and that's when they began to do that. So there's the funeral in the White House, there's a procession down Pennsylvania Avenue, there's lying in state in the Capitol. And I mean, people were so excessively shocked and, and grieving that he actually had to have uh, a number of funerals in about eight different states on the way back to Springfield, Illinois for final interment. I mean, uh, Philadelphia had a viewing, New York had a viewing, Harrisburg had a viewing, Indianapolis, you name it, everybody had one. And uh, so uh, that's exactly how, as you can see, the customs were building up. But that was the easy part. <laughs> the, the hard part was still not addressed. And here's Vice President Andrew jo uh, ja uh, Johnson being sworn into office in a parlor of the Kirkwood House Hotel because in those days, the Vice President had no formal residence. They do now, but uh, that was a fairly recent thing. I think it was like maybe the Reagan administration. And before that, they had to make their own arrangements. And uh, but there was still no law, no code, no anything saying, what do you do? And actually, uh, President Lincoln lived for nine hours after he was shot and no one was running the country. Uh, basically, his secretary of war, Edwin Stanton, literally took over. He issued orders you know, to secure the bridges going out of Washington, to, you know, send out uh, basically what we would call a bolo, be on the lookout for, because everyone knew it was Booth. I mean, everyone, he was one of the most famous people of his day. And uh, everyone had a really good look at him because if you go into Ford's Theater today, I mean, it's not huge. <laughs> Even if, you didn't have that good a seat, you would have still been able to see under the bright gas lights and everything. So uh, 
yeah, uh, we just had to keep going. And I, you know, I, I, so far this was sort of been sort of heavy. So I thought I'd put this in to lighten things up a bit. Uh, this is President Grant. He uh, had gotten several speeding tickets and uh, for racing around and, and uh, a, a, a buggy uh, with uh, a horse, a good horse can do about 35 miles an hour. And uh, so that's pretty dangerous. And uh, basically, finally, he got busted <laughs> on M Street and uh, they took him back to the precinct and he was fined $150, which is about 3,200 in our money today. And they impounded the buggy and he had to walk back to the White House on his own two feet. And he was the president of the United States. <laughs> Now, more serious, uh, James Garfield was wounded by an assassin in 1881. He was going to visit his family in uh, Long Branch, New Jersey, which was and still is a popular New Jersey seaside spot. And uh, uh, the man who shot him he was insane. His name was Charles G. Two, and he felt that he had gotten Garfield elected president. And uh, he was owed because there was no civil service in those days. And basically, as Jackson said, to the victor belongs the spoils. They would hand out all these government jobs to people in the right party who gave the most support. Uh, even uh, Herman Melville of Moby Dick fame, his day job was the collector of the Port uh, of the York Customs for the federal government. And uh, he got that, it was a patronage job. And uh, what was really worse was that Robert Lincoln was with him. And I mean, poor Robert, he had a tremendous amount of guilt because his father, 16 years earlier, asked him to accompany them to the theater. And he had just come in from the battlefield. You know, the war just ended and, and everything. And he said he was tired. He just wanted to go to bed early. He was exhausted. And uh, so he just wasn't there. I don't know if he could have really done much. In fact, actually, there was an able-bodied man with the president and and the first lady his name was major charles rathbone and he struggled with booth who slashed his his arm and so but it, it's just this absolutely hideous you know coincidence and what was even worse is that the president was with his two eldest sons so they were there when their father was shot and they brought him back to the White House. And uh, he, the president was in such torment that the Navy actually rigged what we would consider the first home air conditioning system in existence. They had uh, huge vats of ice in the basement and electric fans. And it was conducted up through these uh, rubber and linen tubes into the president's bedroom. And uh, they even brought in Alexander Graham Bell who had just invented the metal detector to see if they could find the bullet. And uh, it didn't uh, work because the superintending physician, Dr. Bliss, I mean, he ran that sick room with a rod of iron. Uh, a number of physicians, including uh, Dr. Susan Edelson, who was the personal family physician to the Garfields at the first lady's request was there and he would only permit them to operate only as nurses. I mean, this was his big score and he was going to keep it. And, but he also killed the president because they, they, they probed the room 12 times. Uh, they did not believe that generation physicians did not believe in antisepsis that was advocated by people like Dr. Joseph Lister in London, as in Listerine, although he had nothing to do with that, but it was named for him. 
And so they had these dirty instruments, dirty bandages, dirty this. And uh, so it just, they probably, if they had left it alone, he might have survived. And now here's the value power vacuum gap again. He's he was incapacitated for two months. Who was running things? And no, I mean, they couldn't swear in the vice president, Chester Arthur, because the president was not dead. <laughs> and uh, it was a big hole they had to deal with. And this is what they tried to do to the president. They removed him from the White House and took him to Long Branch. And they actually built a spur line from the main railroad so that the train could go right up to the door of the house. And uh, it, was, it did help. But the essential problem was that, you know, probing him constantly with these dirty instruments, he got sepsis and he literally died of blood, blood poisoning. Ah, here's the next near Miss Grover Cleveland. Um, he had to keep, he had a cancerous jaw that had to be kept secret. And there was a reason why, because uh, I think we all remember the Great Recession. Well, in 1893, the United States was sliding into a very similar, according to what economists say, situation. And he was so afraid that everything would be worse if the news got out that he uh, was getting surgery and that the whole market, everything would plunge because they had the Dow Jones index by then, which were the top 25 industries in this country. Uh, they didn't have the others yet, but it was the template. And uh, I mean, he went to great lengths. The White House issued that the president who everyone knew was an avid fisherman uh, in my county in Citrus, they have a Grover Cleveland Boulevard because they believed he went fishing there, although nobody truly believes that. But hey, if you go out to Homosassa, you'll see a Grover Cleveland Boulevard because they thought he was there. But instead, he went to New York and he was operated by two surgeons in the East River on a yacht and everyone was sworn to secrecy and they removed the cancerous growth and they fitted him with a rubber prosthetic jaw to conceal you know, the wound. And uh, eventually did get released by the papers. I mean, somebody broke the story. There's always a leak. It leaks have been around since stone tablets. And, uh, but still, I mean, it's really appalling uh, what we were not told. Now, the next one was President McKinley. He was shot in Buffalo, New York uh, by Leon Solgas, who described himself as an anarchist. And basically, anarchists don't believe that humankind should have governments and laws that we can conduct ourselves by ourselves. And uh, it was a very hot day, and it was still the custom for the president to shake hands with the public. In fact, uh, every New Year's Day, well into the 20th century, people would line up by the hundreds to shake. I mean, sometimes the president's hands were swollen to like three times their size from all the hands they shook. And uh, so being hot, it was Buffalo, New York. Uh, a lot of people took out their handkerchiefs to wipe and have a dry hand to shake the president. And so that's what Zolgoth is. You see the handkerchief? He concealed the weapon. Of course, no metal detectors, no pat downs, uh, nobody checking uh, whatever bags you carried with you. I mean, it, it was just incredibly lax by our standards. And we didn't even have a Secret Service yet. And uh, so there was nobody really in charge of protecting the president. And once again, as in Garfield, we still hadn't learned anything. Uh, the president died of blood poisoning uh, because uh, he, uh, ke everyone kept probing for the wound. The hygiene was poor. And uh, unfortunately for poor Robert, Robert was there. Lincoln was there too. So he had to endure three 
of our four presidential assassinations being on the scene. Finally, <laughs> uh, and the thing was we had the Secret Service. It was actually set up in the Lincoln administration, but it didn't have the job of protecting the president. What it did is that modern economists and historians believe that in order to finance the Civil War, uh, for the first time, the government issued actual money, paper money. Before that, uh, the official United States currency was all coins, gold or silver. And so they figured out that something at least half of the greenbacks in circulation were bogus. They were counterfeit. And the Secret Service was meant to find these counterfeiters and prosecute them and put them in jail and restore uh, integrity to the system. And uh, so, but finally they added this duty and this has remained with them ever since. Oh yeah, I think so. It's actually from uh, their website, the History of the Secret Service. It's very informative. And uh, now Roosevelt, who didn't have to uh, endure uh, an assassination while he was president, uh, there's actually a very funny story about him when he became uh, president because uh, he was on vacation with his family somewhere in the Adirondacks and it took all night to find him to let him know the president was dead. And uh, a close associate of President McKinley, Senator Mark Hanna, had a dim view of Roosevelt. And I don't know if you know this, but for a while he spent a couple of years as a cowman in the Badlands of North Dakota. And Mark Hanna said, now that damn cowboy is going to be president of the United States. <laughs> but uh, what happened with him, uh, you know, sometimes presidents and vice presidents don't get along. And for Roosevelt's successor was his vice president, uh, uh, Howard Taft. And he, they had a break. Taft didn't necessarily want to do what he wanted him to do. And uh, in 1912, he decided to run on a third party ticket called the Bull Moose Party. So he's making a speech and uh, some guy from New York, a New York saloon keeper, believe it or not, actually came out and he shot at him. <laughs> and what saved his life, because he was close enough to have killed him, was his rolled up speech. It was in his jacket pocket. And that's what intercepted the bullet. And I mean, it didn't totally stop it. He was wounded. And uh, showing what kind of guy he was, he insisted on finishing the speech before he permitted them to do any sort of medical attention to him. So, I mean, he was, he was something else, but he carried that for the bullet in his body for the rest of his life. I and mean, for once, they didn't kill the president, the doctors, they let it, they let it alone. And uh, in 1919, President Woodrow Wilson was on this whistle stop tour. It was like a grueling 22 day train tour. He was trying to promote America joining the League of Nations that was forming to make sure another war like the First World War didn't happen again which is what we finally achieved in our UN. And uh, uh, he wasn't having much luck and he had had strokes before. So he was really on a very thin margin and he collapsed and his wife, Edith, and his uh, physician, Dr. Gaines, uh, she became the caretaker in chief and her role to this day remains very, very controversial because she herself minimized it but the president was uh, really incapacitated for over 500 days. And, uh, you know, anyone who wanted to speak to the president and there was no chief of staff yet, they actually had to sit and tell Edith what they wanted. 
Now, she was an extremely intelligent, very capable woman, but she was not elected president, and the vice president could not assume his, his, his duties until Wilson died. And of course, Wilson survived his administration. He died in 1924. And, uh, but uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, the Republican Party totally did not like this. They thought she was running the country that, in fact, uh, in a way, we're sort of facing this a lot. A lot of people in the Republican Party are saying, Biden is feeble and he's not quite with it. And it's sort of a replay of Wilson. And uh, not that I'm saying, you know, I hate Republicans or anything, but sometimes sort of patterns keep repeating themselves in history. You learn that real fast when you're a history major. <laughs> and, uh, and she herself always kept saying that, you know, she just, you know, wanted to find out what they wanted and whatever she the, the, the was most important, she brought to the president. But it wasn't as easy as that. And like I said, people are still arguing about it to this day. And President Harding <laughs> actually had a really good stroke of fortune. He uh, uh, died of gastritis uh, before the Teapot Dome scandal broke out. And what happened was, is that we have uh, oil reserve lands, which if you remember last year, President Biden actually released some of the oil to keep gas prices down, but that's supposed to be for our armed forces. But his secretary of the interior, who was supposed to be the watchman, actually sold out to private uh, oil companies to allow them drilling rights for a bribe. I mean, they literally left a bag full of cash in the men's room. <laughs> I mean, he walked into the men's room, another one man walked behind him with the bag and walked out without the bag, and he they, that was it. And I mean, it was just, and this cartoon shows a procession of government things, including the White House that were up for sale. I mean, people were absolutely incensed and he might have faced impeachment from his very own party. And uh, what happened was is that uh, it's really funny because the, here is another strange first because his vice president was Calvin Coolidge and he was on a family vacation in New Hampshire with his father. And when they heard the news in order to make sure there wouldn't be a vacuum of any kind in the transition of one administration to another, his father, a justice of the peace, gave him the oath of office. So he's the only person never to actually have gotten it from the Supreme Court justice, the chief head of the Supreme Court. And uh, it still shows you how ragtag all of this still was. And the President Hoover actually survived a sort of interesting assassination attempt. They were going to blow up the tracks when he was visiting Argentina, but they, they managed to catch them before they could do it. But uh, uh, Hoover <laughs> loved his wife, Lou, very, very much. And in order to spare her feelings, he would rip the front pages off the newspaper so she wouldn't have to see it to see how close he came to getting killed. And as president-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt was shot at in Bayfront Park in Miami and uh, uh, instead, you know, supposedly what happened is that a, a nearby woman saw the assassin in Zangara take out her pistol as she starts striking his arm with her handbag and other and then grabbed him but they got all he got off a wild shot and it actually mortally wounded the mayor of Chicago who died shortly thereafter now <laughs> you can imagine the secret service was very shaken by all this and, and especially heightened by the fact that the president had polio. So it was very hard to get someone in a wheelchair who was wearing braces, five pounds each leg <laughs> to protect them. 
So they made her take shooting lessons and being something of a slave to duty, she didn't want to do it, but she did. She took uh, the lessons. She got her license, uh, the first first lady ever to get a, a license to shoot a firearm. And uh, but according to her secretary, Malvina Thompson, who everyone called Tommy, she often failed to carry it much to the Secret Service's distress. Uh, what was even more distressing is she would take daily walks and if she saw some homeless guy or kid on the street, she'd bring them back to the White House, no questions asked <laughs> to see if they could do something for them. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was really frightening compared to what we do now. And uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, for the first time, the Secret Service realized they had to have an armored car to protect the president. And this was it. However, it takes time to build a bulletproof car. And they needed one right away. And uh, they got aid from a rather strange source. Uh, the, the Department of the Treasury piped up and said that, well, they had an armor-plated limousine they had seized it from Al Capone in 1933, and that's what they used until that was finished. Now, uh, when the president ran for a fourth term, he was very, very ill already, and uh, his blood pressure was off the charts. Even the first lady wasn't totally told. I mean, uh, in fact, she had no qualms about letting him go down to Warm Springs because she thought, you know, it'd be a nice restful place. People wouldn't be bugging him in Georgia. And uh, she herself was at a, a, a meeting of a Washington Women's Club when she was told. And uh, so uh, the president just died. His last words were, I have a terrible headache. And then he slumped. He was getting a, a painting sitting for a portrait and uh, he, was, he was gone as quickly as that. And here's a part of his funeral procession. And uh, they actually had it covered in newsreels, in print, on the radio. And uh, that's what they've, they do with every president. They have uh, the riderless horse with the steers reversed and reversed and the case on military case on and an escort. I mean, the military escort stands around the casket in the white house and they uh, accompany it to the Capitol and stand there. And here's something that I think most Americans have forgotten about, uh, and uh, according to his daughter, Margaret Truman Daniels, she said uh, somebody sent poison to the White House. Uh, uh, these were uh, radical uh, uh, Jews who were trying to force the United States to recognize the new state of Israel. And, uh, and these were Puerto Rican nationalists who wanted freedom for Puerto Rico. They actually attacked Blair House, which is where the Trumans were living while uh, the White House was being renovated. It was in very bad structural condition. That will make another good program. We'll have to look at that. And uh, so it shows you where everything was. And at the top, it says that's where the president, he, op he and his Mrs. Truman actually opened the window to look out in the street when they saw the shots. Now the bullet, there was no, the windows were not bulletproof. Uh, a White House guard was killed. And one of the assassins was shot. That's, that's his body. See, he's right there at the entrance. He almost got into the house. And luckily, Eisenhower's relatively spared. Uh, and this is the still male-only Secret Service. You know, they were still white. They were still male. Uh, and escorting uh, the president's limousine in Gettysburg in 1955. But gradually, this, this began to change. You'll see why. And here's a failed assassination attempt as president-elect 
President Kennedy was in Palm Beach and this guy who had said he had this intense hatred of Catholics uh, loaded his car full of explosives and he was going to ram <laughs> the Kennedy's limousine. And the only thing that actually stopped him from doing that was that the, pres uh, the president-elect was uh, with his wife and children in the car. That's the only thing that stopped them. And of course, we, we remember what happened in 1963. And uh, I actually once speculated that his limousine was accompanied by motorcycle police. And if they had moved their motorcycles towards the car in a way like they had done with Lincoln's carriage, maybe the president wouldn't have died. I mean, is, there's always, no matter how hard you try to do, you nail it all down. Sometimes it can't be done. Now, this is very controversial. This is part of Zap Ruder film. And as you see, Mrs. Kennedy is scrambling over the back and is very controversial as to what she was doing. She herself totally blocked it out. She said she could not really recall why she did that in her lifetime. And there were all these things. Uh, one magazine I remember at the time said she was doing that to plead for help for her husband. Uh, now the agent, his name was Clint Hill, his take was that he, uh, she was trying to gather her husband's brains. And very, I know, very macabre. Uh, and that's how we realized it was uh, serious. But uh, uh, another theory, which I, I sort of tend to favor, uh, is that uh, she was renowned for her coolness in almost any kind of situation. And what I think she was doing is that uh, their, uh, poor Mr. Hill was trying to desperately scramble from his platform across the six foot long deck <laughs> of the Lincoln Continental and that she was trying to help him because there were no handholds. There was nothing to grab onto. And of course, he did get it and he splayed his body over everybody in the car. So, I mean, we'll, we'll just never know. And of course, we remember all that, all the ceremonies and everything. Uh, it was much more muted than what had happened with uh, Roosevelt and, and, and Lincoln, but still very impressive. And that night, November 22nd, 1963, we almost lost our new president because, you know, everybody came back to Washington and the president went to his, uh, you remember the photograph, he's taking the oath of office in Air Force One, uh, he went back to his own personal home. It was a, an estate called the Elms and he couldn't sleep. And without telling anyone, he just stepped out into the garden for a breath of air and a secret service agent pulled out his Thompson submachine gun and almost pulled the trigger. And the agent said that his face went white. That's, that's how near we were to having a second presidential death the same day. Finally, we, we got the 25th Amendment removed the succession elephant in the room, and it more clearly defines what to do if a president cannot fulfill his duties, his or her duties. And, uh, but it wasn't, uh, uh, really always applied, and we'll see that in a little bit. Well, that wasn't until after John. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 something to stuff it takes a long time. You know, uh, you remember last year, President uh, made lynching a federal crime. He signed the leg legislation. This legislative saga trying to get this done began in 1911. <laughs> so it takes time. And uh, 
Here's poor President Ford. He had no luck. Anyway, he fell twice. And in the Saturday Night Live, which was just brand new on the air, made the most of it. And Chevy Chase, he was always falling down, getting up from his desk and everything. And actually, a reporter who was there said that it was actually he had been a former athlete, college football, that he was just marvelously coordinated because the first thing he did was disengage his hand so he wouldn't pull his wife down the steps with him. And he just, I mean, nothing got broken. <laughs> I mean, he lost some dignity to be sure, but uh, he, he knew how to do it. Hey, come on, here. And of course, he's the only president ever to have had two uh, assassination attempts aside from Lincoln. And um, though uh, fortunately for him, he survived. And uh, the first one was uh, Squeaky Frome, one of Charles Manson's people. And then a few weeks later, a woman came, Sarah Jane Moore, and they both spent more than 10 years in prison. They were eventually pardoned in the early 21st century. And, uh, but it's really, and one of the themes you see here, and I, I sort of mentioned this because it happens to be June Pride Month, is that there's a lot of collateral tragedy I mean, two presidents were murdered in the presence of their wives. One was shot in the presence of his two teenage sons. And uh, in this case, with Sarah J. Moore, they had a real honest to God hero. His name was Sipple. He was a former Marine in San Francisco. He was also a homosexual. And he actually knocked the gun out of her hand before, uh, but even though she got one shot out, but it didn't wound or kill the president. But the newspapers outed Mr. Sipple to the entire world, and he had not told his family because this was the 1970s. You didn't just tell people, it, it was known to his friends, but his father disowned him. He sued the newspaper, the media trying to get recompense uh, for all the grief and torment they caused him because they, they just were like a dog with a bone on him. And uh, he failed to win the case because the court said that since it was known to people who said that they knew he was gay, he wasn't, it wasn't protecting his privacy. So he, he really went through the mill for being a hero. Well, here we go, six years later in 1981, uh, you know, John Hinckley, the president was leaving a hotel uh, and uh, Hinckley started firing and uh, press secretary James Brady got severely wounded and never fully recovered. Another agent was wounded and uh, but the president, they shoved them into the limousine, piled in after him and took off. And I mean, they were going to take him back to the White House. It, it, he seemed all right. But in the White House, the president started bleeding out of his mouth and they immediately turned around, went to George Washington University Hospital. And the uh, president was still fully conscious, but wounded just badly enough. And with his age, because at the time, remember, he was the oldest president ever elected. Uh, he could have, it could have been very serious for him. And, but he still had enough of his faculties because in the operating room before they put him under, he, uh, they told him he would receive the best of care. And he said, well, I hope you're all Republicans then. <laughs> Well, here's where we're getting into the 25th Amendment. Uh, Secretary of State Alexander Haig, uh, George H.W. Bush was uh, flying in, hadn't yet taken the oath of office because, you know, the president was still alive, but nobody knew whether he would be or not. And uh, somebody asked Haig, who at the press conference says, uh, who was in charge? And he says, I'm in control here. <laughs> I mean, and the papers accused him of doing a military coup of the government, even though he was a civilian by this time. 
and uh, a little later in the Clinton administration, you may remember this, somebody flew, I mean, the White House grounds are restricted airspace. Nobody is allowed to fly over that. And uh, so he flew and you see how close he got to the wall of the house. I mean, if, if the president had been standing by a window there and he had gotten just a few yards further, he would have breached part of the fuselage, at least through a window, he could have killed somebody. And the thing was, is that he, he had no particular ill will to Clinton or his policies or his administration or the man himself. He just wanted to commit suicide and he thought that would be a cool way to do it. And this was something in 1998, uh, the Secret Service had were forced by the courts to break a very long standing tradition of never revealing what they see or what they hear of uh, what a president does while they are in their presence. And they had to do it. And uh, so it, it, this was a major fracture as far as they were concerned. Well, since then, uh, we saw this in 9-11 in uh, attacks. Uh, the president was here in Florida at a school. And when he was informed, the Secret Service, they sprang into action. And by this time, they, they had diversified. They had women. They had you know people who were not white. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they just immediately secured him and Vice President Cheney. They uh, took them on two separate Air Force. They have Air Force One, Air Force Two, to two separate secret locations to make sure that somebody survived if it got worse. And see, here's actual photographic proof. They do actually have women. And uh, they do a lot of things. I mean, they have to, uh, they get, mail and electronic threats, threats all kinds, just or just electronic chatter, like be a good day to kill the president, wouldn't it? And uh, so they uh, they even protect presidents after they leave office. In fact, you may remember, uh, I think in 2021, yeah, uh, pres uh, former President uh, Trump's children, they removed Secret Service protection of them, but President Trump still has it. And I mean, this precedent of the Secret Service having to testify about the president, this issue may come up again. And they really operate on a worldwide basis. They are part of the Department of Homeland Security. They work with the other foreign agencies like Interpol and uh, and they do a lot of the mail. I mean, something like uh, uh, President uh, Bush, the second President Bush got literally 3000 threats a year in the mail that they had to go through. Uh, President Obama got four times as many threats in his term in office. And they have to, they really have to be on the ball. And this is really a fun thing. I actually recently saw a video called uh, James Corden's late night show. He did this thing called carpool karaoke where he'd be driving around and he'd have people with him and they would sing. And uh, so he did one with Michelle Obama before, you know, they left the White House. And this is the Secret Service's hands at work. They were not permitted to go out on the streets like the rest of them. The, she had to drive them around the grounds of the White House and with the a, a Secret Service car carefully behind following their every move. But she explained to him because he asked her, how do they get Secret Service names? And she said, yes, they did. And what they did uh, in the Secret Service, every presidential administration gets assigned a letter in the alphabet. And theirs was R. So her husband was renegade and she was renaissance. And so the Secret Service has some sort of leeway on how they perceive the president and the first lady. 
And so uh, the, uh, the trumps were, of course, S and the binds are T. And then when they get to the end of the alphabet, they just start all over again. And that is the end. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation of all the things that have happened to our presidents uh, over the years. And if you haven't. Mm -hmm.